Hi, this is Rich Pratt from Third Millennium Ministries, and I want to thank you for joining me in the sixth session of our Study at Home series on the book of Hebrews. In our last session, we saw that the book of Hebrews calls for us to reject false teachings and to hold to Christ because he is the Messiah who brings the great judgments and blessings of God in the last days of world history. Now, in this session, we're going to turn to a second theme that appears in every major section of our book. We're going to see that the author of Hebrews exhorted his audience to follow Christ because the sacred scriptures of the Old Testament reveal that Jesus is the Messiah. As we explore this emphasis on the Old Testament in the book of Hebrews, we'll be challenged to renew our commitment to the authority of the Old Testament and how it exalts Christ as the Messiah, the supreme king of all of creation. Now that we've seen how the recurring content in Hebrews includes a focus on the last days in Jesus, we should turn to a second repeated element in the book, the author's Old Testament support for his theological views. By most calculations, the book of Hebrews quotes, refers to, or alludes to the Old Testament nearly 100 times. These interactions with the Old Testament scriptures were so crucial to the author's purpose that they appear in every major division of his book. And of course, it isn't difficult to understand why. To challenge the teachings of the local Jewish community, the author of Hebrews appealed to a common document they all held sacred, the Old Testament. For the purposes of this lesson, it's helpful to see five main ways that the author of Hebrews repeatedly treated quotations from the Old Testament. In the first place, he drew attention to factual backgrounds from the Old Testament. Simply put, the author recalled some historical detail from the Hebrew Scriptures and quoted a few words. He then incorporated the facts into his presentation of the Christian faith. For instance, in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 2, he explained that the name Melchizedek, king of Salem, from Genesis chapter 14, verse 18, means king of righteousness and king of peace. This factual background then enhanced his comparison between Jesus and Melchizedek. As another example, in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 20 and 21, the author noted Israel's fear at Mount Sinai, reported in Exodus chapter 19, verses 12 and 13, and Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 19. He then contrasted Israel's fear with the joy of the heavenly Jerusalem for Christ's followers. In the second place, the author also noted abiding theological outlooks established in the Old Testament that were still true in his own day. In these cases, rather than noting simple historical facts, the author focused on theological beliefs affirmed by the Hebrew Scriptures beliefs about God himself and other matters in close relation to God. For instance, in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 5, the author referenced 2 Samuel chapter 7 verse 14, or its parallel in 1 Chronicles chapter 17 verse 13. Here, God declared that every king in David's dynasty would be called God's son from David's time forward. In Hebrews chapter 1 verse 7, the author quoted Psalm 104 verse 4, where angels were described as serving spirits. In Hebrews chapter 2, verses 6 through 8, he cited Psalm 8, verses 4 through 6. He argued that God had ordained human beings to be lower than angels only until the end, when mankind, not angels, will rule with Christ over all of creation. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 13, refers to Isaiah chapter 8, verses 17 and 18. These verses demonstrate that the blessings of God's vindication will be shared among members of Abraham's human family and not among angels. In Hebrews chapter 6, verses 13 and 14, 
the author cited God's oath to Abraham from Genesis chapter 22, verse 17. Here, God established that his promise to Abraham was permanent, extending even to New Testament times. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 29, the author quoted Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 24, describing God as a consuming fire. He did this to strengthen his teaching that God is still a consuming fire in Christ. Similar examples appear in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 4 through 7, chapter 8, verse 5, chapter 9, verse 20, chapter 10, verses 30 and 31, chapter 10, verse 38, and chapter 13, verse 5. In all of these passages, the author of Hebrews insisted that certain theological outlooks established in the Old Testament continued to be true in New Testament times. For all that the writer to the Hebrews insists that Jesus is superior to the Old Testament, yet at no point does the writer to the Hebrews downplay the Old Testament or insist that it is passé or might easily be skipped over, we don't need to read it anymore, we have Jesus. Uh, there's not a hint of that anywhere. Uh, everywhere the writer to the Hebrews treats the Old Testament with immaculate respect. It, he understands that it is the Word of God. and. Um, more importantly yet, it's the Old Testament that establishes all the categories that make sense of who Jesus is. Jesus is a high priest. What's a high priest? That's established in the Old Testament. He offers a certain sacrifice. Um, what does blood mean? Uh, what does the most holy place of the tabernacle mean? Yes, now in Hebrews it's the heavenly tabernacle, but that's already been established as a category by the earthly tabernacle and then the Solomonic temple. Um, uh, so many of the categories, even at the level of personal behavior, are established by the Old Testament hallmark of faith. For example, in Hebrews chapter 11, or the bad example of those who fell away in the desert at the end of Hebrews chapter 3. All, all of that is drawn from the Old Testament. In the third place, the author of Hebrews also noted abiding moral obligations. In these cases, the author pointed out that God had placed certain moral requirements on his people in Old Testament times, and these obligations were to remain as standards for God's people in New Testament times. For example, in Hebrews chapter 3, verses 7 through 15, he indicated that Psalm 95, verses 7 through 11, taught Israel not to rebel against God. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5 and 6, showed that Proverbs 3, verses 11 and 12, urged Israel not to be discouraged when God disciplined them. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 13, instructed his audience to follow Proverbs chapter 4, verse 26, and adhere to the path of righteousness. And in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 6, by quoting Psalm 118, verses 6 and 7, the author urged his audience to confess confidence in God. All of these references pointed out that Old Testament moral obligations continued to be in force for followers of Christ. In the fourth place, the author quoted a number of eschatological predictions from the Old Testament. In many passages, Old Testament authors made predictions about the last days. They wrote about what God would do when Israel's exile came to an end and God's victorious kingdom spread throughout the world. The author of Hebrews used several Old Testament eschatological predictions to show that God's final judgments and blessings are fulfilled in Christ. For instance, Hebrews chapter 1 verse 6 noted Deuteronomy chapter 32 verse 43 as it was translated in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament. This verse says that angels will bow in humble worship when God has his final victory over all his enemies. In a similar way, in Hebrews chapter 1 verses 10 through 12, the author quoted Psalm 102 verses 25 through 27. This passage predicts that the current arrangement of creation, in which angels are greatly honored, will be destroyed at the end of history. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 13 quotes Psalm 110 verse 1 to show that David's prediction of universal sovereignty for his great son exalts the Messiah over angels. In Hebrews chapter 5 verse 6 and chapter 7 verse 17, the author referred to Psalm 110 verse 4. He emphasized the prediction that David's great son will not seize his royal priesthood for himself, 
but will receive it from God. In Hebrews chapter 8, verses 8 through 12, the author referred to Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 through 34. These verses predicted that after Israel's exile, the new covenant would overcome the problem of human failure in God's covenant with Moses. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 16 and 17 refer again to Jeremiah chapter 31 to show how the new covenant in Christ eliminates the need for further sacrifices. The author of Hebrews appealed to similar predictions about the last days, or the eschatological age, in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 21, chapter 10, verse 37, and chapter 12, verse 26. In the fifth place, the author referred to a number of dynastic ideals that were established for David's lineage in the Psalms. These passages express standards of faithfulness and service to God for everyone in David's dynasty. But at best, David's Old Testament descendants only reached these standards imperfectly. The author of Hebrews insisted that Jesus is the supreme, perfect fulfillment of the ideals for David's royal house. For example, in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 5, the author quoted Psalm 2, verse 7, and 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 14. These verses indicate that God adopted a descendant of David as his royal son to rule over vassal nations. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 8 and 9 quotes Psalm 45, verses 6 and 7. This royal wedding psalm extols God's reign over all by honoring a king in David's dynasty who loves righteousness and hates wickedness. In Hebrews chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, the author referred to Psalm 22, verse 22. In this verse, David pledged to share the joy of his vindication in the assembly of other Israelites. The author used this verse to show that Jesus perfectly fulfills this dynastic ideal by sharing his vindication with the children of Abraham. In Hebrews chapter 10, verses 5 through 7, the author referred to Psalm 40, verses 6 through 8. In these verses, David pledged to devote his whole body to God in the place of animal sacrifices. The author applied this to Jesus, whose bodily sacrifice on the cross was the supreme eschatological fulfillment of this ideal.